Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and to be able to present my research. As you mentioned, I'm conducting this project with uh, Professors Philipp Schorch and Professor Magnus Treiber at the um, LMU in Munich. And um, we heard about uh, Frobenius' expedition just now. And there were also, was also an expedition that uh, was called the Frobenius' expedition, not to Australia, but to the Molucan Islands. I have an image here. They are today part of Indonesia. Is there, wasn't there a thing uh, yes. to? Yes, <laughs> May I? Let's see, will it still work? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so just to, to, for those who are not so familiar, um, we are here. We are moving now a bit further north, even from Australia, and this dark blue uh, marked uh, area here is the Molucan Islands um, with the biggest one Seram here and uh, Ambon, uh, the main one a little bit further down. So the expedition that I mean uh, was conducted in 1937 and 1938 by Adolf E. Jensen and Hermann Niggemeyer, who were uh, anthropologists here in uh, Frankfurt. And the scientific output that emerged from this particular exhibition um, has become classic works of anthropology. And they collected over a thousand artifacts, uh, which are now housed at the uh, Museum for Völkerkunde, today the Weltkulturmuseum. Unfortunately, most of them, as with many other collections, were destroyed during the Second World War. But what I'm trying to point at is that until now, Jensen and Niggemeyer um, are associated with one of the earliest and ex most extensive ethnographic research visits to the Moluccan Islands, but of course, um, they were not the first. There have been many expeditions before that, also with um, yeah, scientific output. And one of them, 25 years earlier, and they also sold some uh, artifacts which they um, collected here, and uh, they are now still uh, at the um, Weltkulturmuseum, and I had the pleasure of visiting the depot actually yesterday and having a look at them, and it was really interesting. So the expedition that I'm talking about is, as you mentioned before, the Zweite Freiburger Molucken Expedition, so the, the second uh, Freiburg Molucken Expedition. And it was carried out mainly on the island Seram. I'm having here like a bigger picture of the, of the particular island. And this expedition was carried out between 1910 and 1912, and it was led by Karl Deninger, who was a geologist and paleontologist. And he was accompanied by Odo Deodatus Tauern, a really beautiful German name. He was a physicist and anthropologist, and he was also a passionate filmmaker and photographer, which of course benefited the expedition. And by Erwin Stresemann. Stresemann, not to, it's not Gustav Stresemann, Erwin Stresemann, it's, it's a different one. Um, and he was sort of a universal scholar, can be said. So he was mainly interested in zoology, botany, geography, but also, and importantly, linguistics and ethnography. And if any one of you here is just a little bit interested in ornithology, you've most definitely heard of him, because he was one of the most influential ornithologists uh, in the German academia, and he also wrote a classic piece that every student, I bet, knows. The Entwicklung der Ornithologie von Aristoteles uh, bis zur Gegenwart. It's a really prominent uh, work. And on April 29th, 1911, these three men, Deninger, Stresemann, and Tauern, arrived at Amahai Harbor, so there's only really one way to get to Seram. You come through Ambon here and then start here, and this is where they arrived. And let's see here. Yeah. Now, during this expedition, so they were there for almost two years, they traveled mostly the western part of the, of the island, but also went to the neighboring islands, Ambon, Buru, and Misol. And they collected a significant uh, amount of artifacts, um, birds and insect specimens, of course, for the ornithology. They documented their journey through photographs and film recordings. They carried out geomorphological measurements, and they also um, strongly engaged in linguistic and ethnographic studies. And Karl Deninger and Erwin Stresemann were mainly interested in a local language that was spoken around here, around here, the language of Paulohi. Of course, uh, I'm so happy that Christina presented uh, before me because now you're perfectly prepared. Uh, 
Of course, they also relied on local expertise to acquire all that uh, knowledge and all these items. And in this expedition, there's one person that stands out um, especially, and that is a man named Marcos Malopu. Um, the research, research project started in May, so uh, you're now getting the fresh start. Of course, we did one year of preliminary research. But hopefully by the end of this research, I will be able to start with him. But uh, for now, we still need some, some introduction. Yeah, what makes Marcos Malupu stand out? It is uh, the fact that although we know uh, so little about him that I ca cannot start my presentation, we actually know quite a lot uh, about him compared to other expeditions um, at the time. And to start with, he's mentioned in one of Stresemann's uh, most prominent publications on the islands. This is the original, but I have um, an English quote here. So uh, this is uh, on the Paluhi Sprache, the language I just mentioned. And even before this is the, the very first pages, he states, the Ceramese from Samasu, named Marcus Malopu, who was in our service for several months on his home island, as well as on the island of Buru, decided to accompany us to Germany for one year. As a Christian, he was fluent in reading and writing and showed exceptional competence in the task that he was assigned to, which was to give deeper insights into the structure and essence of his mother tongue. During his stay in Germany, he kept a diary in the language of Paulohi. The presentation of the grammar that I have attempted in this book is based essentially on this material and on oral conversation. With the exception of the last one, the reproduced coherent speech samples in this book were all written down by Marcos himself. So as was common at the time, Marcos, although he apparently greatly contributed, was not made co-author of the um, publication, but even a remark like this um, is quite remarkable for the time. There are even uh, more indications that can be found. And um, yeah, this, uh, this is only the start, which uh, yeah, gives a hint of their relationship that they had. And more indications can be found across various disciplines and various institutions uh, across Germany. And the one that um, has started off this whole project are two diaries, the ones that um, Stresemann has just mentioned in his, um, in his acknowledgments. And they look like this in their house at the University Archive in Munich. Um, there we have uh, Stresemann's estates, especially connected to this ex expedition. And um, of course, there are also diaries and letters and notes from all expedition uh, participants, so Stresemann, Dinninger, and Tauern. But this is what initiated our, um, our research. So these are the two diaries written by Markus Malopu, the man from Seram, uh, who joined the expedition members to Germany. And of course, we're gonna have a quick look inside. Yeah, the quality is not so, not so good, but at least uh, we can work with it. So as you can see, Markus Malopu did some drawings. But for the most part, the diaries contain handwritten text in two languages. And the left one is always Malay, which was spoken in Indonesia at the time and differs slightly in spelling and um, yeah, also grammar from uh, today's Malay and Indonesian. And the text on the other side is either Paulohi or, as can be seen here, a language that Markus labeled as Alifuerru or Alipuerru, and it is most likely uh, linked to um, the language Wemale, which is also spoken in West Seram, around that part. Erwin Stresemann was interested in the linguistics of these texts. Of course, I'm interested in the ethnographic accounts that uh, these hold, and therefore I'm going to show you this second image. This is from the Black Notebook that you just saw. We have here the really unique situation that a man from the Moluccas worked ethnographically in Germany. So what he describes on this page can be understood even without much uh, linguistic training, I think. It is apparently Christmas, and Markus Maluku describes the habits and customs uh, of his hosts. For example, the Christbaum, see, uh, I marked it, um, which he uh, describes as the lightened tree, or a lightened tree. And a couple of pages later, he also explains the sacred ritual of drinking schnapps on Christmas Eve. Very important, of course. And of course, the three Germans, as common in expeditions, left numerous details, accounts, published, unpublished. And uh, these diaries speak back 
at, um, at them and somehow fill a gap, Lehrstelle, uh, um, in this particular history of, of the creation of new knowledge. These are two textual examples, but of course not only textual records recount uh, Marco's trip to Germany, but also images. This image, for example, is um, yeah, it's a really, really bad image, but we see here Marco skiing in the Black Forest. And when I saw this image, I really thought they must really have had a good relationship for Marcos Malopo to leave his, his country and his home to come to Germany and stay with the, with the people that he had just met on the islands. Not so much Tawan, because Udo Diodatus Tawan seems to have been a somewhat uh, difficult person, so he split and uh, went on alone, and the other three kept on going. And um, Marcos Malopo would actually not return back home to the Moluccas from this journey, because in 1913, so he spent one year here in Germany, in Freiburg, and then he decided he wants to join another expedition, and he went to Africa, to the colony of Cameroon, the German colony of Cameroon at that time. And he was there for five, uh, five years, and then decided to join the German military forces. And uh, this is where um, his traces uh, are going missing. Um, he got uh, lost somehow in, in the midst of the, of the war that was going on there. So we learn from um, the, the text that um, Stresemann wrote that Marcus gave useful insights on the local customs and languages. But uh, what is interesting is that he also took part in the practical work, so he was not an informant in that case. This is an image that is housed at the Ethnologisches Museum Berlin. Uh, this is actually an image that an anthropologist took 20 years ago and uh, he told me that the um, storage was uh, really bad for images so I haven't had the chance to go there yet but we will see what the, what the archive uh, looks like now. I hope they are still available there, these images. So this image depicts uh, Deninger, you can see Deninger here finally, the one on the, on the left, the expedition leader, he was 32 years at the time, and Marcos Malopu on, on his right, and they are inspecting specimens of stuffed birds. And this image here depicts two men engaged in a joint endeavor, and it seems to have provided a quite solid base for a mutual relationship, simply the conduct of scientific inquiry. And of course, this image uh, it admittedly has a staged quality. See that they're holding still, but even more so, what they tried to stage here in this particular context, the photographer must have been either Tawan or Stresemann, is that Markus Malopu and Karl Deninger in this specific moment, in this situation, are equally taking part in a process of knowledge creation. And this is why, Christina already alluded to that fact, and this is why I, I prefer the term interlocutor or interlocution, because as opposed to informant or conversation uh, or interview, um, it points clearly at this situation of reciprocity, uh, a moment of talking between, if translated literally, that allows people to create mutually through a communicative encounter. It only works if you, if you encounter someone. Um, uh, yeah, it depends the participation of both parties and this word interlocution also allocates for the mutual effect on this outcome. You cannot interlocute alone, you need um, a counterpart. Um, as we all know, this reciprocity um, in these situations has been largely neglected um, and in this specific case it is uh, still quite unknown. So the second Freiburg am Lucken expedition is not really um, that known. And our project follows a quite similar um, approach than what Christina has just proposed. And it is uh, utilize, utilizing this archival uh, material that I've just shown uh, for a digital intervention. So the digital really helps us to, um, to fill this gap that uh, I presented. And we will also first reassemble this, uh, this material that the expedition members, including Marcus now, uh, put forth. And try to reconnect their, their shared history across time and space, but also, and importantly, this is uh, why I like ethnology so much, through across disciplines, uh, because they worked uh, yeah, in multiple disciplines and we are now able to, to recollect this all together, because apparently it is connected. And only in Germany I was able to detect seven institutions that hold records which have been produced, informed or collected um, in the course of this expedition. And by um, 
recollecting this material online in a similar way that Christina has just um, mentioned, uh, allowing open access and uh, the co-curation of the material also, so the way that it is narrated, the story, um, with stakeholders from Indonesia and the Netherlands, which is the, the former colonizing state, of course. Our research aims to decenter this provision of information because as of now, the stuff is in the, not stuff, the records are in the archives here, closed up, and no one has access to them. And secondly, to facilitate the multivocality of this representation, what I'm presenting here is my story, the way this story has come to me, but of course there are multiple other stories that are equally as interesting and equally as important to be shown. And I think as can be seen really clearly from this image here, the relationship that is at work is um, a bit more nuanced than the common Western scientists and local informant binary suggests. There's something happening here. And I have one more example from the archives to make this point. And this is actually now from, from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And this is a plaster bust. And it was commissioned by Erwin Stresemann in 1912, so at the time when Markus Malopu was in Germany. And it depicts Markus Malopus in, um, in the traditional classic representation of academic intellectuals. So it's this, this classical format that we have here. The sculptor was Friedrich Meinecke. He worked in Freiburg and created statues and uh, facade designs, but also demonstrative ethnographic plaster figures, so Schaupuppen, which were also bought by the Naturkundemuseum, Natur- und Völkerkundemuseum in Freiburg at the time. So Meinecke's work was heavily related to the visual translation of evolutionist theory in practice. But my Lopus figure, uh, my Lopus bust, uh, was not displayed at a museum. It was actually placed on Stresemann's office desk because he was in charge of the ornithology department at the museum uh, in Berlin for many years. And when he was asked about it, Stresemann said the bust depicts a friend. This is what a former student recalls, Eugenius Novak. And um, last month, I was actually able to visit the uh, museum in Berlin. So I went there, and the assistant of the archive, she was so kind to bring Marcus down for me. I don't know if it is, um, yeah, if, if it really shows on the picture, this is life size. So it is a real life size portrait. And uh, she brought him down for me. There's no, uh, no elevator, so she really had to carry him on, on the stairs. And um, I sat at the study room, um, looking at the, um, the notes of Stresemann's time at the, um, at the museum, and there was Marco staring at me like this the whole time. He was in front of me, and I worked, and I did my stuff, and Marcos was looking at me. And then when everyone went to have lunch, the last one to leave was like, are, are you two staying here? And then I was, yeah, yeah, we were still getting acquainted. Um, uh, we're staying here. And then when I was alone, I realized that even before, everyone at this archive had treated this bust as if it was a real person. And I just had done the same without even thinking about it. So what I like about this is what uh, Christina has just, uh, just mentioned, that the materiality of this bust, um, of course, especially through this coloration, which is really unusual for plaster busts, um, it somehow demands interaction, it lures you into interlocution. So the question is, is this bust now a testimony of early anthropological paradigms? Or has Stresemann created a counterpart for him, a gegenüber, to carry on um, with their productive interlocution, even after uh, Marcus uh, has left? So I really like the notion of agency that you, you just mentioned. and. Um, uh, Alfred Gell has radically suggested to uh, imagine objects as social agents also, as carrying an agency and um, yeah, being able to uh, be evoked uh, in an interlocution. And uh, in this um, instance, I really felt that. So the material records that are connected to this expedition, the, what I just showed you, and this past in particular, they really help us or work as social agents 
to help us reassess and re-narrate this, this history that's, or this story that Marcos Malupo can tell and I'm really looking forward to seeing the multiple histories and the multiple interlocutions that will uh, arise with the interaction here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.